Good morning, all. Good morning. All right. I'm Dr. Javon Adams Gaston. I'm the Vice President for Student Life here at The Ohio State University. And on behalf of the Office of Student Life, we want to welcome you to this year's Hip Hop Literacies Conference. We're so happy that you are here with us. And let me say one word. Um, there is something that I never do that I did today. And I did this on behalf of my staff person who is with the Student Life Multicultural Center. And Catherine Betts, if you'll just wave your hand, told me I needed to look much more hip hop today. So she told me, you need to wear some jeans, Dr. J, and you need to wear some heels, neither of which I ever wear to work. So thank you, Catherine, for getting me hip hop coordinated. Um, one of the things about our university is that we are willing to tackle tough problems. We are willing to have the conversations that are important to our community and to communities across this country and around the globe. I first have to give kudos to Dr. E. Is Dr. E here? Uh, okay. I, I thought you had stepped out for a second. There you go. Dr. E has brought to this community the Hip Hop Literacies Conference, and she's done it with blood, sweat, and tears. She has made this happen despite the things that we may not have provided in the early days. And each of us who are engaged with her and this conference know how important this is to the university, but also to the nation and to the world. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., born and raised there, family raised there. And uh, I go way, way back on this because my uncle, who was John Snipes, um, sometimes known as the mayor of D.C., owned several shirt shops in downtown D.C. on U Street. Um, his good friends were Dewey Hughes, and if you know anything about um, early television and early African Americans on television, you know a little bit about Dewey Hughes, um, and you know that Kathy Hughes was married to Dewey Hughes, and the rest was history. Um, and a person named Petey Green. The three of them were buddies, and Petey Green uh, did television shows in D.C., and there was a movie out about him a few years ago called Talk to Me. And one of the things that my uncle talked about was that they were really the early pioneers of hip hop. And that is, they used to do a lot of rhyming poetry that spoke, uh, spoke truth to power. And what I learned, and we have a legacy in my family of having Kwanzaa celebrations, and so my uncle, before he was deceased, used to come and do some of those early works of what you really would identify as hip hop legacy, and this whole notion of speaking truth to power, which I think is what we all know about the hip hop tradition. So it's very gratifying to have this conference, to have it continue in the way that it has continued. This conference brings together scholars and artists and experts, and you guys are all unified. All of us together are unified to address these issues, to find solutions, and as the conference suggests, to accept, acknowledge, and change the fact that we are at the crossroads and we are in a state of urgency. We don't have time to fool around. We only have time to get refocused, retooled, and to begin the work that is so important to make the change. So I am so pleased that 
um, Dr. E and Catherine Betts on behalf of Student Life, the Office of, Disabil uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the university have put together an amazing lineup for you over the next two days. I know that you will find the conference enlightening. I know that you will find the conference thought provoking. It will be challenging, but as importantly, it will be a great deal of fun. And so I thank you for your interest, your time, but most importantly, I thank you to your com for your commitment to this very, very important component of our history, our culture, and our nation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Javon Collins. I'm the program director of the King Arts Complex uh, here in the Near East Side, or actually near downtown here in Columbus, Ohio. I'm the program director, and it's truly an honor to work with Dr. E and everyone for this uh, Hip Hop Literacies Conference. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how my connection to Ohio State has led me here today. Uh, during sixth grade, as a student at Wilbur Park uh, Middle School, I was told that I was up for a Young Scholar Scholarship in which I had no idea what it was, uh, but they said it was an opportunity to go to the Ohio State University. So, of course, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. So, uh, you know, uh, I had an opportunity to be a part of that program, and in sixth grade, I was actually given that scholarship at the King Arts Complex, in which I serve now as the program director. So, um, just going to Ohio State University every summer, for six years led me to the Ohio State University in which I graduated. Uh, so I'm just a very proud alumni and again, proud to be a part of this, this great conference. Uh, during my freshman year here at Ohio State, there was a, a different Ohio Union, it's, it's not the same, but um, I was actually a, a hip hop artist and I actually won a talent show here at the Ohio State University. So uh, a lot of things that have gone on in my path have kind of come full circle and to be a part of the Columbus community and to continue to strive for excellence here in the city is just a great, great opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you all this weekend. So as you know, tomorrow, uh, the events will take place at the King Arts Complex. It's an uh, African-American Arts Institute, 60,000 square feet in the near east side of Columbus, Ohio. So if you're not familiar with Columbus, Ohio, Mount Vernon Avenue was basically the African-American epicenter of this city. So you'll get a chance to experience that with us. Uh, we have plenty of great activities tomorrow in which we'll have events in our theater. Uh, our auditorium and our dance studios with the, round pan with the round table discussions as well as the panel discussions. And of course, at the end of the night, we'll have the uh, MC battle, the fashion show, and the, the concert with Yo-Yo. So I know you're all excited about that. But most importantly will be the opportunities to network and also learn about what we can do and what change we can make uh, with the hip hop uh, community in which uh, so much going on. I, I'm virtually a product of the hip hop generation when it starting pretty much, you know, with my birth. So I've seen it, you know, I've seen the ups, I've seen the downs, but I know it's a, a true challenge for us to, to make sure that the next generations get the, the right education about what they see on TV, the images and things of that nature. So it's great to be a part of this conference with all the scholars and all the great people who are, you know, a part of this conference to make sure we're, we're setting the right example and we're giving the, the accurate information about hip hop culture and things of that nature. So I look forward to you all joining us tomorrow and to be a part of this conference and to be at the great King Arts Complex. We're very, very proud of the institution and um, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you. Morning. Oh, uh, y'all can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, see, I know it's early. I woke up early too. I'm a little tired up here. <laughs> My name is Janae Littlejohn. I am a 17-year-old senior at Gahanna Christian Academy. Um, I'm actually going to perform a piece for you guys. This is the Hip Hop Literacies Conference. So, 
Um, this poem that I'm going to perform for you guys is actually the first one that I wrote. Um, it's called Feminine, and Dr. E invited me to perform this for you guys. So just sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. Not every black girl is some hoochie wannabe. Popping out a baby before they turn 16. See, you might think because of the color of my skin that you automatically know what's going on within. Well, think again and take a step back. I'm so tired of being stereotyped just because I'm black. Take a second and do some meditation because you're gonna need it once I finish my education. I bet you didn't really expect that from me, but you will when I receive my PhD. So you think all I'm good for is money, work, and sex, but I use my mind as my muscle. Now watch me flex. Oh yeah, you might think I'm ghetto because I get loud at times, but don't worry, I'm educated. Do I need a caution sign to warn those around me that I'm not just some other hood rat, that I'm doing things in my life that's got me on the right track. At the end of the day, I know who I am and that's all that matters because see, God made me in his image and he gave me my talents. Not some stereotype, not black, not white, because when it's all said and done, see, I report to the highest, the God of all gods who has no bias. So I forget about the opinions of you and any other men because at the end of the day, I'm just feminine. Sister, somebody, this needs to be down there toward the end so people can ask their questions. How y'all doing? Because y'all mighty quiet. This is a hip hop conference. Y'all can't be sitting up here like I'm about to die. I love you guys. Thank you so much. I am Dr. Elaine Richardson, better known as Dr. E. Someone asked me why I do the Hip Hop Literacies Conference. They said, E, Hip Hop and Literacy, how you put those two together? Well, I'm a professor of literacy studies, and a little known fact that many of us are rarely exposed to is that literacy is partly oral that literacy is cultural, that literacy is political, that literacy is diverse, that literacy is a part of your identity, that literacy is influenced by how you experience the world. It's historical and it's defined by its definers. And so I wanted, I wanted to build a conference that I want to attend. I wanna see us all together, our community, scholars, educators, artists, students, young people, families, talking about issues that concern us all. All of us together making sense out of hip hop as a culture, an art form, an industry, a global youth culture with origins in people of African and Latino descent. How can we all do our part to understand hip hop, to understand how it's all tangled up in world systems and how to use it to make the world better? Thank you so much for supporting this conference. I would like to now thank all of our sponsors. We could not do this conference without the aid of so many wonderful departments at OSU in the community, as well as in the, the larger community. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Department of Teaching and Learning, the King Arts Complex, the National Council of Teachers of English Assembly for Research, Teaching and Learning Diversity Committee, the Multicultural Center, and Ms. Catherine Betts, the sweetest woman on this planet, the Frank W. Hale Jr. Black Cultural Center, the Office of Student Life, the Women's Place, Literacy Studies at OSU, the Kerwin Institute, the Departments of English, Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Linguistics, Dance, African American and African Studies, Middle East Studies, Diversity and Identity Studies at OSU, Sexuality Studies, Arts and Humanities and the Arts and Humanities Diversement Enhancement Committee, the Ohio Hip Hop Awards. I would also like to thank Dr. Lee, Dr. Valerie Lee, 
Dr. Adams Gaston, Ms. Lynn Berry, Ms. Betty Ellis, Ms. Susan Mager. Now those names don't mean a lot to you guys, but those are the people who did all the paperwork, who helped make sure all the grants that I got go through the right systems to make sure people get paid. They're important people. So can we please get a clap for Ms. Lynn Berry, <laughs> Betty Ellis, and Susan Mager. They made, they made a lot of stuff happen. Mr. Larry Williamson of the Frank Hale Center, Sister Catherine Betts of the Multicultural Center, Dr. Davida Haywood of the Multicultural Center, Mr. David Boyer, the Diversity GA, where's David? David is my right-hand man. Uh, Miss Krista Benson, Ariana Howard, Sierra Austin, Erica Womack, Kia Crenshaw, Ashley Patterson, Theo Ressa, Miss Gail Gray of the City of Columbus, Priscilla Woodson, Earth Jallo, Javon Collins, and Tony Johnson of the King Arts Complex. Uh, it takes a whole lot of people to make this conference happen, and, and, and nobody's getting paid for it except the scholars who come in and the artists. <laughs> but the OSU people, it's a labor of love for us. So we really, you know, this is something that we want to keep doing. We want to keep growing it. So if you have, if you enjoy this conference and what we're trying to do, which is build coalition among each other and with the community, please tell other people about it because we're trying to do it bigger and better every year. And in fact, some of the funders that we have, we can't keep going back to them. So we might, uh, you know, I need you to get the word out there so that you might be able to think, help us build ways to keep raising money to keep having this conference. Um, we also would like to thank the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Humanities Council. Okay, I hope I didn't forget anybody, but if I did, count it to my head and not my heart. Logistics. The panel chairs after this session, please do your job and keep presenters on track. Please keep the panels on time. Don't let people go on and on and on. Cut them off. Cut them off at their time. Uh, you know, they should be prepared with the, the time that they're supposed to talk, but if they just get the Holy Ghost and they keep talking, give them the Baptist finger. <laughs> um, for the breakouts uh, at the end of this session, Catherine is going to show people, hold up your hand, Sister Catherine Betts is going to show people the room in the Multicultural Center where the next panel is, and David will take people to the Great Hall room. David is sitting in the back. He'll walk you to the Great Hall room. Uh, please turn in your evaluation forms. If you're staying for the whole conference, turn it in at the end, but if you know you're only going to come to this panel, fill it out and leave it with the people at the desk or leave it with Theo, or, uh, or, or Sierra, or Ariana. We need your feedback about this conference. Last year, over 300 people attended, and we only got 45 evaluation forms back. That's not good for funders. We need you to, we need you to help us, OK? Please turn in the evaluation forms. Every time you see me, if you speak to him, I'm going to say, Where, where's your evaluation form? Did you fill it out? Are you going to have it to, with you today? You're going to have it tomorrow at the King Arts Complex? We need, we need that. Um, Ashley, Ashley Patterson is going to walk people to the Frank Hale Center at 1145. You will meet Ashley at the College Road entrance at the Ohio Union. So it's to the left when you walk out this door. We're walking to the Frank Hale Center for lunch and we're going to meet by that College Road uh, door um, of the Ohio Union to get to the Hale Center for lunch. Uh, I think I said, oh, tomorrow you know that there's a bus. If you come to the 9 a.m. session tomorrow, which will be at Ramsire Hall, there's a bus that we will take from the Ohio Union to the King Arts Complex at 1015. So right out here is where you get the bus at 1015 in the morning. We'll walk from Ramsire down here and get the bus to the King Arts Complex. If by some act of God or yourself that you miss that bus at 1015, don't worry about it because the bus runs every half hour and there's also a van. You could walk to the Hale Center and take a van to the King Arts Complex and we'll have that van as well. So if people 
you know, if you can't stay even for the whole day at the King Arts Complex, know that we have a van that can bring you back to your hotel or to campus. Okay, and now the moment we've all been waiting for. My sister, Professor Martha Diaz, is an adjunct professor of individualized study at New York University's Gallatin School. She is a community organizer, educator, media producer, archivist, and social, social entrepreneur. She has been dedicated to advancing social justice, cultivating leaders and artists, and mentoring youth for over 15 years. She was a pro production assistant for the late Ted Dem, the TV and film producer, director behind Yo! MTV Raps, and among other productions. Professor Diaz produced and directed H2O, which stands for Hip Hop Odyssey, a short documentary on the evolution and global impact of hip hop culture. In 2002, Professor Diaz performed the H2, formed the H2O International Film Festival and subsequently developed the Hip Hop Association, H2A. For seven years, she served as president and executive director of H2A, and she is currently its chair. She launched H2O Newsreel, the first hip hop media distribution label dedicated to the education field in collaboration with Third World Newsreel. Professor Diaz co-created and edited the Hip Hop Education Guidebook series with Marcella Runell Hall. And by the way, please buy the books at the back table because most of the people who wrote them are in this room. So we want to support each other. You know hip hop is about entrepreneurship. So spend your money with your people. In 2008, she launched the Womanhood Learning Project as an intervention strategy to empower women in hip hop. In 2008, NYU Gallatin graduate, as she was a graduate student and a Katherine B. Reynolds Fellow, she founded the Hip Hop Education Center for Research, Evaluation, and Training in partnership with Dr. Pedro Nogueira of the Metropolitan Center for Urban Education at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Behavior. Please help me welcome Professor Martha Diaz. Thank you, Dr. E. Oh, this is so wonderful. Um, it is a great honor to be here with you today. Um, wow, I'm already inspired and ready to go. I, I want to um, just, you know, go out and do more work because there's so much that needs to get done. And um, hearing the young lady do her poetry just pumped me up like, yes, this is what it's all about. You know, just creating this pipeline so that we can continue this work. Um, I'm not a morning person. Um, I'm, yes, and you are not either. Um, I, I get very nervous when I speak. Um, and these are just things I want to share with you so I can get comfortable. Um, I guess I want to begin with just why I do what I do. I know there were a lot of uh, different roles I played, but, you know, hip hop made an impact on me at a very early age. Uh, I would say around 11 and 12, I knew that, um, as a first generation Colombian American, that my community, my family was hip hop because I didn't have any cousins, I didn't have any brothers and sisters at the time actually. I had a little, little brother that was born eight years after me. But, um, but hip hop became my community. Um, going to the roller rink and hearing Africa Bambada, Soul Sonic Force, just took me out of my element and just made me dream. You know, hip hop educated me on black history, on Latino history, on consciousness. It raised my consciousness. It liberated me. It inspired me to be who I am today. And because of that, I felt it was necessary to preserve hip hop culture. So when I started working for Yo! MTV Raps, 
I was, of course, honored to be there with Fab Five Freddy and Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. And, you know, I was barely, you know, coming out of my teens. So working at MTV was a privilege, right? But soon after I arrived, I realized that they weren't telling the complete story. They weren't really showing us hip hop culture. It was just really one side, a hip hop business side, an entertainment side. And although there were sprinkles of conscious hip hop, especially, you know, during the golden era of hip hop, um, it wasn't enough for me. I wanted more. And so I asked MTV to to do to do more, and they they just couldn't. To this day, I you know I asked them to do a global hip hop show because in the '90s we were already seeing hip hop in Russia. We were already seeing and hearing about people bootlegging Yo MTV raps all over the world. So I knew that this was a phenomenon that was growing in the early '90s. And of course, you know, Trisha Rose wrote her book Black Noise in the early '90s. So we're beginning to see that scholars were taking hip hop very serious and creating books in the academy on hip hop. But that wasn't enough for MTV. So at that time, I broke off and became an independent filmmaker because I realized the power of media to tell our stories, to keep our cultural heritage alive. And so I became an independent filmmaker, started working with different um, people like Ralph McDaniels and Lionel Martin, who were some of the first directors who created music videos for Nas and Wu-Tang. And, you know, I worked for Ted Demi on other films, too. Who's the man? And hello, who's the man? It was, you know, it was all right. But Hollywood wasn't for me either. It was just not, you know, I was missing. I was going through this, this struggle of, of identity, of knowing hip hop one way, growing up one way, and seeing it on TV as another thing. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't understand it, and I wanted more. I wanted more for my community. So when I would go to the Zulu Nation meetings, and I would learn about the fifth element of hip hop, I would leave there like, okay, what else can I can do? What can I do? And that's when I decided to document the culture. I started using my own funds and going into the community and interviewing all these legends, these pioneers. But that didn't get me anywhere either because I wasn't making money. And at this time, I was a single mother with two kids, so I was broke. And so that wasn't, that wasn't gonna work for me. So at one point, I was asked to go to South Africa with Black August. How many of you know the Black August movement, Malcolm X grassroots movement? Okay, two back there, yes. Yes, well they, you know, they have this um, annual concert in August and um, a few years after they started this concert, they started to travel to different places, Brazil, Venezuela, and they went to South Africa and they invited me to document what they were doing. And I went with Dead Prez and Tariq from The Roots and Boots from The Coup and other artists, including Tony Blackman, who will be here later. And I saw how young people in South Africa were doing so much with so little that I came back and I was like, okay, I'm starting a nonprofit organization. Um, it's gonna be a film festival. And I just came back motivated to do something for my community. And when I did the film festival, I gave a lot of filmmakers a platform to tell another story, an, an, an alternative narrative to what was going on on TV. And that just blew up so much that it was, beyond my capacity. I was also a teacher during this time and I was trying to uh, use hip hop in the classroom too and 
and it was working. And again, I was like, wait a minute, can I create a platform so other teachers could come together, share best practices? Yes, so that's what became the Hip Hop Education Summit. So everything just kept evolving and, and you know, this was trial and error. And by 2008, I realized I needed to go back to school to learn how to make real money because I was still broke. It didn't matter how much I was doing in the community, how much of an impact I was making. I was still not sustaining myself. So when I came back, Okay, when I came back, I decided to create an organization that would measure impact, that would help scholars, practitioners to do this work so they could sustain themselves. And that's how I got to this point. So we all know that hip hop appeals to everyone. It transcends race, gender, socioeconomic background. Um, we know that it impacts uh, across disciplines, sectors, and borders. You know, we see it in business, right? We see the moguls, how they're making millions of dollars. You know, Latifah just did a partnership with Netflix. Um, you know, Rock Nation, Jay, you know, is just doing his thing, selling tickets, managing people. Um, co-owner of the, the Nets, uh, you know, team. Swiss Beats just um, did a partnership with Monster. Um, and of course, the Rush Card, we know about that. And, you know, Eminem is also part of the business of hip hop. This is not it. Okay. We know how hip hop impacts politics, right, because in 2008 there were all these campaigns, uh, you know, to get black young people to vote and Latinos. Of course, there's Rosa Clemente who was a vice president candidate in the Green Party during the same time that Obama was running. Um, and then uh, George Martinez and his wife, he is the first MC to get elected to political office. And um, he, he also ran for Congress a few times. And, you know, Kevin Powell, of course, was in the real world, and then he was in the real world running for Congress as well three times. Um, and during this time, you know, for the first time, we saw black voters had the highest turnout than ever before. And so this was due to hip hop's involvement in hip hop and politics. In politics, I should say. Okay. And we also know that hip hop is global. We have a hip hop cultural envoy, hip hop uh, ambassador, that's what Tony Blackman is. And, you know, we have in 2001, in 2001, KRS One united all the pioneers at the United Nations, and we formed a charter with the United Nations for peace. Um, so we're recognized as a culture of peace. We are also working with the United uh, UN Habitat and other United Nations um, agencies like UNESCO as messengers of truth, as diplom diplomats. Um, over there to the left where um, Secretary Clinton um, is standing with Pamela Castro. She is, Pamela Castro, a.k.a. Anarquia, is from Brazil, and she won the most prestigious award a woman could receive, a global award for women's, you know, activism. And so that was given to her by Hillary. And then we have Trinity International Hip Hop Festival that is the largest international hip hop festival going on now for seven, eight years now. And then we have exchange programs. Trisha Rose, um, Eric, Mike, Michael Eric Dyson. These are all people in the academy making moves. We know that um, Bum B is teaching hip hop and spirituality. Um, Ninth Wonder is at Duke and now he's also a, a scholar at, at Harvard. Um, hip-hop archives, and Quest Love is teaching at NYU, 
And these are my two scholars in residence, Carlos Mayer 139 Rodriguez and Iona Roselle Brown, who are graffiti artists, pioneers. We're seeing hip hop in, uh, hip hop archives. Um, we, I just went to a Tupac's uh, Shakur conference last September. Yes, and it was amazing. It was amazing to see how much you can do with hip hop um, archives and education. And it was just really an inspiring um, conference to attend. And of course, you know, the hip hop archives at Harvard. Cornell has the largest hip hop archives. Of course, this literacy conference here today is one that is noted. And, you know, there are others around the country. We even have a hip hop minor at Howard University and the University of Arizona just announced their hip hop minor under Africana Studies. Um, the McNally School has a hip hop diploma. They also have a scholarship for B-girls. Um, and the University of Wisconsin has the first undergraduate spoken word and urban arts learning community where they have uh, committed to one point $2 million a year in scholarship for young people who want to focus on spoken word and hip hop. We're seeing hip hop in K through 12. The High School for Recording Arts has been around for 12 years and their whole curriculum is around hip hop um, pedagogy. Um, Danny Zarazao is a principal at the Unity High School in Oakland. You know, Big Boy has his summer camp, like Yo-Yo, like Pharrell. Um, Scratch Academy offers DJ lessons after school, and they, they um, offer it to over 100,000 people a year. The Peapod Foundation, which is the Black Eyed Peas Foundation, they launched three music academies, one in Oakland, one in Los Angeles, and one in New York. Again, a, an academy so young people could learn how to produce music. They teamed up with the Adobe Foundation. So for me, I started to see all of this and wondered where is the evidence? What case studies exist? Who's keeping track of the field? There was no centralized location where I can find all of this information. So I decided Okay. Okay, I skipped a, a slide. And I wanted to know what was available uh, in hip hop pedagogy to transform lives of youth. So I decided to create the Hip Hop Education Center in 2010. This was during my uh, NYU um, graduate program. Um, and so I teamed up with Pedro Noguera because he was the foremost education leader um, focusing on dropout rates and um, black male achievement, Latino male achievement. And I figured it was important that we, we, we share information because I knew people who were addressing this dropout rate crisis and he knew the lingo to speak to uh, to um, leaders in the community in the Department of Education and superintendents and principals. He knew how to pitch what we were doing and I knew that I can provide resources and tools and so it was a no-brainer. He took me under his wing and he cultivated the Hip Hop Education Center as a center that would support hip hop scholars, practitioners, and so forth. And we do this with research, evaluation, training, advocacy, and social enterprises, meaning we support entrepreneurship. We certainly believe that you need to make a living and you have to do it through curriculum development, publishing, books, etc., and public speaking. So the first thing I did was create a, a national scan to figure out what really exists. I knew some of the things that were out there, but we needed to find out what was happening nationally. And 
we have a report that I published, which you can find online, um, that really shows the breadth of hip hop education. We had almost 300 participants take the survey and And some of the results um, that we found really shows how there's a greater influence to the work that we're doing. So the, f the number one element that was used in hip hop education was the fifth element of hip hop. 76% of the programs included the fifth element, knowledge of self and the community. And what we realized was that, wait a minute, what happened to the other 24%? Why aren't they using the fifth element? And that was problematic. That was a red flag, like, wait a minute. And we discovered that a lot of these programs that didn't use hip hop, fifth element, weren't including the history or the pioneers or anything that had to do with the culture. The second element um, which is a tied, tied element, emceeing and spoken word, 73% um, of the programs used it. The third element uh, most used is the graffiti element, and then the b-boying element. When we look at hip hop entrepreneurship, which I don't see, uh, there's only 40%. So that was really low. I thought we could raise that up and, and actually connect the elements. We also discovered all the different academic disciplines that were connected to hip hop education. And these were, again, surveys that were taken by practitioners that told us really what they were doing in the classroom. English language arts, entrepreneurship, geography, et cetera. We also um, found out what the skill building activities were. And these activities were directly linked to the common core standards, which is great. Because now we can say, oh no, this is common core, da, 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 because we have oral skills and debate, because we have writing skills, we have problem solving, negotiating. We also discovered that most of the programs were in New York. That's where hip hop was created, so there had to be more programs there. But there were 10 countries outside of the US that took the survey too, including India, Brazil, South Africa, China, which was very interesting for us. And actually, um, we now have an international survey to, this, to see what's out there globally. So who do they serve? Well, the majority of the program served that 14 to 18 year old population, 81%. That's the population that drops out. That's, we, we are focusing on the most critical demographic. And then the second uh, demographic is the 19 to 22 year old. So these could be students that have dropped out or phased out, college students. So we are, th those are our demographics. And of course, we're still focusing on the kindergarten, 25% of our programs, and we're still focusing on the adult population. So that's very interesting. We're also focusing on uh, African American and Caribbean, 88%, then the Latino population, then the mixed race population, white population, 61%. That means these programs are also in the suburbs, also in private schools. And we started to really break all of this information. This, there's a larger uh, report online, like I mentioned, that you can find additional information. We also, uh, work with the Native American community. It's a very low number, but it's almost like they're isolated. So if we had more contact with them, I'm sure that number would rise. And we discovered that 82% of the programs 
use teaching artists to co-teach. That is very important because now we could argue that teaching artists need to be paid like co-teachers. They need to receive the benefits like a co-teacher would. So some of the projects um, were hip hop in, in all the disciplines from science, math, geography. We saw hip hop uh, youth participatory action research where students would go into the community and conduct surveys or they would create murals. We had media literacy projects. We had um, hip hop in the community where the pioneers would come and talk with the youth. The youth would interview them. Um, they would come and co-teach as well. We uh, saw a lot of film screenings, um, students hosting film screenings. We saw a lot of beat making, spoken word album making, exchange programs, and hip hop theater. And these are, again, some of the programs. So in addition <clears throat> to this, I wanted to know more. So that, that was one, one piece of our research. Great, we now know that all of this information exists. We know that this number is low. 300 is low, it's a low number. So we know that that's just a sample of our population. So in addition to this, what can we do to show others that they can do it too? How can we direct them to the resources? So the next question we posed was, what are the resources that exist? And the normal, you know, the, the media, the hip hop history, we can point to movies that exist that address about every issue, social issue out there. You know, women in hip hop, misogyny, you know, race. And we saw films on international hip hop that also existed. And you know, not only documentaries we have, Hollywood has their movies that we can also use for education. Um, we have all these books every year. Last year, I don't know how many new books came out, but we're just seeing a proliferation of books being published, hip hop books being published, and here are just some of them. Here are the ones that address hip hop and education. And you know, these books are important because they really talk about the theory, which I'm not gonna talk about today because you will get that in your um, breakout sessions. But theory is very important. Culturally relevant pedagogy, we can connect hip hop education to that. We can connect um, social justice you know, pedagogy. We can, we can, we can use hip hop to address all of the, um, the theory that, again, scholars would be interested in and uh, the Department of Education would be interested in. And these books um, are great resources for that. We also see a, a proliferation of hip hop didactic materials. I mean, we, we created, Marcella and I created the first book that showed the different ways you can use hip hop in the classroom. We just had a sample, it was like a sample lesson book. Um, but now you can get anything from, you know, teaching how to color and um, learning Chinese to um, preparing for the regents exam. You know, vocabulary, which is up there on the upper left hand corner, they were one of the groups, one of the projects, one of the programs that did not include the fifth element of hip hop. They're in 2,000 schools. That's a problem. We had a meeting and we discussed this. And what happened is that he admitted one of the founders admitted that he had no connection to the pioneers. That he loved hip hop, he supported hip hop, but he had no relationship with the community. And so we're seeing more of that. We're seeing more curriculums and material, educational materials that have no affiliation to our community and they're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We also seeing books on the business of hip hop. Our business moguls are writing books on their success. And it's very important because we can learn a lot from them. Um, Elena Romero released a book last year on the, the movement, um, 
how hip hop changed the fashion industry. At one point, it was a crazy number. It was like $12 billion industry at the height of hip hop fashion. We were a billion dollar industry, just the fashion industry alone. This is information that young people could use, could get inspired by, and now we're seeing another wave of hip hop fashion, an independent wave. And of course, Steve Stout is the king of advertising, hip hop advertisement. Um, and so he, he, he talks about how hip hop broke all the rules. So um, I also wanted to research the hip hop artists and scholars and activists and filmmakers that were out there and create a database. And we discovered again, hundreds of our people just doing the work in the community, not only in the US, but abroad. And so this information, we wanted to do something with it and, and, and connect it to the pioneers and, and make sure that the pioneers are always involved. And so we're developing this website that you would have access to this information, information of community groups that are doing great work. Um, Word Beats in Life has a teach-in each year great resource for you to go and get more professional development, for you to network with other practitioners. And like this conference, you know, we need to continue to support these um, conferences so that we can formalize the field of hip hop education. Of course, Hip Hop Congress has been doing great work in the universities for over a decade. And they have about 36 chapters in different universities in a rap session, I mean, this all this information is important because it's a resource for you. So new possibilities. Um, well, we're seeing that hip hop collections, archives are now being linked to hip hop education. We're now witnessing a new phase of hip hop pedagogy where the artifacts are being brought into the classroom or teachers are taking students on field trips to museums, to um, universities, to libraries, so that they can look at uh, flyers, um, clothing, and um, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a hush tour, bus tour in New York where they take people to landmarks, hip hop landmarks. So we're starting to see that uh, we're mapping out hip hop culture and for each state, you can do the same thing. So New York, of course, is where hip hop began and we're, that's where it's starting, but this is something that's gonna happen across the world. Um, we're also starting to see hip hop and health really take off. You know, hip hop public health focuses on um, uh, being being a healthy child, uh, being nutritional, um, focusing on heart disease and exercising. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, Russell Simmons teamed up with, with Erica Ford and she has an organization called um, uh, Life Camp and they're doing yoga classes in schools and um, that's Deepak Chopra, by the way, which supports Russell Simmons. We are seeing hip hop dance for the deaf community. Um, Steve Buddha just got a fellowship um, with Ashoka, giving him $100,000 to do social work in the, in, in the Inuit community in Alaska and um, Canada. And so we're really starting to see that hip hop is a form of healing, is a way in which we can um, reach young people and, and, and help them deal with um, issues of distress. Um, hip hop psychology, you know, I, I showed a, a, a slide in my previous slide, a picture of the Hip Hop Forum movement. That is a conference that is on hip hop therapy and psychology. They're gonna have another one in April, I believe. And then there are, again, books on therapy. Okay, and we're st really starting to see hip hop and spirituality take off. Last year, about four or five books were released on hip hop and spirituality. And of course, it was Karis-One with his gospel of hip hop that set it off. 
um, even though others would argue that the nation of Islam, you know, and the 5% nation already, you know, got started earlier. But, um, but you know, we're really starting to see how hip hop and, and Islam and um, Jewish hip hop, they're, they're really starting to talk about how hip hop is being used to reach young people in spirituality. And so I definitely see this as a new possibility and a must a, a, a needed possibility because it's directly connected to the fifth element of hip hop. And, you know, they, they I hear all the time people saying, um, you know, uh, hip hop is, is, you know, there's a, we're waiting for the next hip hop. We're waiting for a new genre to, to emerge. But really, hip hop is evolving. And what we're now really starting to see is the multicultural side of hip hop. Global hip hop has taken off, and we are seeing it through these books um, that really focus on every part of the world. And along with the books are movies. And so we really are going to start seeing curriculum connected to ESL, English language learners. And so that's very, very exciting. And then hip hop and technology, you know, um, how many of you know who DJ Spooky is? Okay, a few of you know. You know, his app, which you can see up top, is an app that you can teach DJing and you can produce a song and broadcast it through iTunes. It was downloaded 10 million times. Um, Rap Genius, of course, you've heard, you know, they just got $15 million for their hip hop wiki, right? They annotate uh, hip hop lyrics. Um, hip hop word count to hear Hemphill's uh, rap almanac, where you can research uh, a, a, a word. For instance, in this example, he's researching champagne, how, how many times it was used in, in rap lyrics. So we're seeing searchable engines that make it even easier for students to conduct you know, research projects. And last year, last semester, we teamed up NYU Teachers College at Columbia, the University of Wisconsin, to do a three campus video conferencing public lecture series. That's a mouthful. And we, for the first time, that was the first time, we were able to have um, speakers, address hip hop pedagogy and in all three campuses where young people were interfacing with the, the speaker and with each other. And so again, this is just the beginning. And then of course these citywide competitions, you know, this is my favorite and of course Chris Emden it will be here tonight and he'll talk more about this. But this is a phenomenon here. I mean, he teamed up with uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of the most important scientists of our uh, era and our century here, and um, the Jizza from Wu-Tang. And they created the Science Genius Battles with 10 schools. And this is a citywide initiative that the Department of Ed is supporting, is funding. Now, if this succeeds, which it will succeed, this opens up the door for other competitions. And so this is the future. And that's it. Thank you very much. I know, that, I know it was a lot. I, I, I just had to show you that hip hop education is, is bigger than, than what we think it is. And now that the celebrities like the Swiss Beats and the Quest Love and, you know, um, they're entering the academy and they're joining us. They're actually sh you know, shining the light on us, our movement. So it is time for us to ask for that money and to really position ourselves as the next phase of hip hop culture. So we're ready for some questions? Yep. Yes, uh, please show her some more love. <laughs> she deserves it. We read her work in my hip hop literacies class and that's how we uh, found out about the nationwide study of hip hop and education. So I know some of you must have questions. So please come to the mic because it's being videoed. No, they can't. No, come to the mic, Brother Yassine. Is that Brother Yassine? That's Brother Yassine. Yes! Hey, how you doing, Marcia? Marcia, we want to thank you and Pedro and everybody down in the way you follow your work. 
I have one question to ask you, though. You mentioned, I've forgotten whom the person was whom you mentioned who was doing a hip hop therapy because I, and, and, and where that conference was, and you said it's gonna be done again because you know Yancey and the people at Fordham yes, had one last it's, year. It's them, it's them, Dr. Um, Edgar Tyson. Yeah, is that the same yes, one? and Laura, okay. Laura Gardner. Laura, okay, that was yes, my the same people at Fordham University, okay, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is the conference that puts scholars in conversation with the community. This is your opportunity to have your questions answered. I'm sure there was something in there that you want to hear more about. Well, can I find out who is the audience? Like, how many? This is a mixed audience. It's okay. scholars, it's educators, it's parents, it's can you raise community your hand elder, you, can, elders, there are students here. Can you raise um, your hand school, if you are a hip hop scholar? High school students. Yeah, high school students. A hip hop teacher? Some of you are both, right? A college student? High school student? Parent? All right, yes. Okay, you're right, it's a mixer. Administrator? Okay, we got a couple, very important. I hope this was useful information. I have a question for you, Dr. Diaz. Thank you so much for your uh, for sharing this information with us. Um, I really think it's terrific the way that, you know, we're bringing together and we're seeing this evolution in many ways of folks who use hip hop in classrooms, folks who use hip hop beyond classrooms and use it in very productive ways, right? And to see a generation of scholars who have been informed, right, by hip hop, scholars, researchers, practitioners, right, these, these identities get blended but we're now at a point where we're seeing more and more of this information. I'm not surprised 